Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Rania. I'm an undergraduate student in film studies. Uh, I'm the communication uh, coordinator here at Cinema Politica Concordia. We're very thrilled to, virtu to virtually welcome you tonight's event inspired by uh, the, sc the screening of No Visible Trauma, directed by Mark Sipka Frankfurt and uh, Rabender Upel. We're honored to be presenting this important, powerful, and urgent film tonight, as we're deeply saddened by the recent events around the police killing of La Jewel Tool in Calgary, which is yet clearly demonstrates deep and systemic flaws of the police as an institution. That's why we're here tonight. Cinema Politica stands in solidarity with abolitionist and anti-racist organizers across the country, as well as communities and families directed, directly impacted by the anti-black racism and all forms of institutional violence. We're extremely honored to host our special guest tonight, directors Mark Serpa and Frankfurt and Robender Upal, film protagonist and activist Gottfried Adai, and uh, Marianne Opez from the uh, coalition of the Defund of the Police, the Defund, the Defund the Police, and Simon de Beauvoir Institute, and moderated by the amazing Desiree, Desiree Rashad, community educator, educator, and transdisciplinary scholar. Tonight, tonight's event is co-presented by the Collective uh, Against Police Brutality, Defund the Police Correlation, Communication Department at Concordia University, CGLO Radio, Multi Multimont Film, CQT Radio, the Art History Graduate Students Association of Concordia University, CUT, CUTV Center of Oral History and Digital Storytelling, and the Concordia Undergraduate Journal of Art History, also known as CUJA. We're also very happy share, to share that this is our last live stream event of the season. Hopefully for a long time as we're going back for our theaters at Concordia University on, in Montreal on, on Monday, March 14th. We're also prepared a fascinating programming for March. Uh, we're starting off with the Oscar nominated documentary, Writing with Fire, then the very powerful film Rufu Palestine and Dope is Dead by the Montrealese filmmaker Maya Donvan. We're also very thrilled to be able to welcome back everyone from inside and outside Concordia back to our screenings, something we were not able to do last semester. Uh, in the meantime, please sign up for our e-newsletter, e check out our offerings on Cinema Politica On Demand platforms, and follow us on all over social media so you can keep, keep, uh, so can keep you informed about our upcoming events. Uh, before we begin, we acknowledge that Cinema Politica's main office is located on the undeceded land of the Gani Gahana Nation. We believe it's not enough to acknowledge the title holders of the lands where we live and work. Rather, we urge everyone who stands, who attends our screenings to become involved with anti-colonial indigenous-led struggles that existed in, uh, in Joja, Gahe, and beyond. Now, a quick breakdown on tonight's event. We'll start off with a brief introductions of our guests. Um, that we urge everyone who stands, who attends our screenings, my apologies. Uh, we'll start off with a brief introductions of our guests who will engage with the conversation about the film and their work for about 30 minutes. After this, we'll open the floor for questions in the audiences. Please leave all your questions on the, either the Facebook Live or the YouTube uh, comments. We'll be moderating them and uh, communicating your questions with the moderators. Uh, I would like to introduce our host tonight, our moderator, who will be introducing the rest of the guests. Uh, Desiree Rashad is a community educator, a, trans a transdisciplinary scholar, scholar. Her work is guided by an inter integrative approach connecting community work, historical research, community-led archival preservation, and popular education. Through her patience, she, she documents, theorizes, and transmits uh, the stories of Black communities activists. She holds a PhD in educational studies from the Department of Integrated Studies and Educational at McGill University. Uh, Desiree, please feel free to introduce everyone else. Hi, everyone. And so I'm very humbled to be moderating this panel tonight. Um, thank you for the introduction. So tonight we welcome Marc Serpa Franquer, Robinder Upal, Godfred Adai Nyamekie, and Marianne Lopez to the discussion on the movie A No Visible Trauma. Uh, Marc Serpa Franquer and Robinder Upal are documentary filmmakers and interactive producers 
whose work builds on lifelong interests in immigration, diversity, and social justice issues. Serpa Franker and Upal are the co-founders of Lost Time Media, which has produced a wide range of linear and interactive documentaries since 2013. Godfred Adai Nyameke was born and raised in Ghana, West Africa. He immigrated to Canada as a teenager and has been fighting for justice and systemic changes. He had the courage to share his story in the documentary Above the Law, No Visible Trauma. Marlian Lopez is a Black feminist activist and community organizer tackling issues surrounding anti-Blackness, gender-based sexual violence, and its intersections. She is currently co-vice president for the Fédération des Femmes du Québec and program and outreach coordinator at the Simone de Beauvoir Institute. She is also a co-founding member of the Coalition to Defund the Police in Montreal. And before we start, I would like to uh, just begin with the excerpts from Yves Tuck and Wei Yang's article entitled Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, as an invitation to reflect on what anti-racist social justice activism and activism against forms of state violence on unceded indigenous lands also entail. Decolonize, a verb, and decolonization, a noun, cannot be easily grafted onto pre-existing discourses and frameworks even if they are critical, even if they are anti-racist, even if they are justice frameworks. In this set of settler colonial relations, colonial subjects who are displaced by external colonialism, as well as racialized and minoritized by internal colonialism, still occupy and st settle so stolen indigenous land. Settlers are diverse, not just of white European descent, and include people of color, even from other colonial contexts. This tightly wound set of conditions and racialized, globalized relations exponentially complicates what it means to decolonize and by solidarity against settler colonial forces. This is precisely why decolonization is necessarily unsettling, especially across lines of solidarity. And so one of the ways I engage with current histories and is with stories from our past. Um, and on this 28th of February, 2022, I thought it was important to start this conversation by retelling the story of how in the city of Montreal, where I am currently, 34 years ago, almost to this day, a crowd of about a thousand Black community members took to the street to protest the acquittal of Constable Alain Gosset. On Sunday, February 27th, 1988, the crowd gathered in front of the parking lot of the NDG police station where Gosset had shot dead 19-year-old Anthony Griffin barely three months before. Gosset had faced charges of manslaughter but was acquitted by an all-white jury a few days before the protest and was eventually temporarily reinstated in the police force. As the story reminds us, and as no visible trauma exposed in details, police violence has a long history in Canadian cities, as does elsewhere in other countries. No visible trauma actually exposes the various forms of violence engendered by the police and the legal system that often protects officers. And so I would like to invite Mark and Robin Durr to start this conversation by sharing with us how and why you got to making the film and how you see the role of making such a movie, of telling stories, if you'd like, in relation to the struggle against police violence. Uh, hi, everyone. Sure, I can uh, start us off. Thank you so much much for uh, having us. This is a uh, long uh, to present our work at Cinema Politica. Uh, we actually, you know, we both born and raised in Calgary. We did not uh, come at this film with the desire of uh, making a polemic or even just a film, broadly speaking, about the Calgary Police Service. It really all started for us with Godfrey's story, and we're so glad to have him here with us tonight. Uh, when we met Godfrey back in uh, 2015, it was not long after he had been acquitted, as we see in the film, of, uh, of assaulting a police officer. Uh, we, as we spoke to him and then started looking into the in, into the the case and the the materials from the trial, we were just so 
profoundly disturbed uh, by what he had been through and all the myriad ways in which uh, the system had failed, both in terms of the various uh, criminal uh, actions of the different police officers involved, and then, of course, the Crown prosecutors in choosing to uh, prosecute Godfrey uh, and not uh, any of the officers, and still to this day, any of the officers involved in what had happened to him. Uh, jump forward a couple of years to early 2017 when we learned that uh, an, uh, charges had been announced against an officer. It wasn't immediately clear who it was as he wasn't named, but it became clear that it was the same officer, Trevor Lindsay, who had uh, assaulted and left uh, another uh, individual, in this case, Mr. Haworth, with a permanent brain injury. That was really what uh, compelled us to start like taking a look at the broader systemic issues at play. Uh, particularly because we knew that Godfrey had filed in a timely fashion a formal complaint with the police department uh, surrounding what he had been through. So how was it that this officer, uh, given the fact that the investigation was still pending, had been left, uh, uh, allowed to be out on the street and to go on and do such horrible harm to somebody else? Um, so that was really, I think, what uh, was the instigation for us to take that uh, broader look at uh, the systemic problems in Calgary and in Alberta writ large. Yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, our film is really like a starting point and, you know, we're trying to foster a discussion about police accountability. And I think the film makes clear that, you know, it's really important that we do hold police officers to account because if we don't, it just, it's a cycle that perpetuates itself. And I think the other thing that really, you know, it made us make this film was that we realized that Calgary with not the largest population in Canada in both 2016 and 2018, as you see in the film, they shot and killed more people than any other city across the country. And that may, that might make you think that maybe it's just Calgary, but actually, I mean, all across Canada, there's been an average of about 30 people shot and killed by police for the last 10 years. In England and Wales, that number is far, far, far lower for a much larger population. So Canadians have just come to accept this kind of human sacrifice of people just being shot and killed whenever they encounter police officers. And I know that, you know, Godfrey has found himself in a position to say, I'm, I'm lucky to be alive because I don't know what would have happened to me had things gone a little differently. Um, yeah, it's, it's horrifying to think how many people have near-death experiences or are killed. And I think Lat Chortul's death in Calgary uh, only a few days ago really points to this culture. If you look at the comments that people post when they see these videos, they make it seem like this is the only outcome that could have happened. And, and I think our film... And, and everything that we're trying to do around engagement around this film is saying, there's gotta be a better way and there is a better way. We can't just look to the US and say, these are problems that are happening there. They're happening in Canada and we have to demand better from our, from our police and from our government institutions to hold police officers who act poorly to account. Absolutely. And I think also there is a longer history, right? And so when we start to look at it, I think you center on Calgary but each city, when you start to dig in, you realize that each city has a long history of police violence. And then you realize that every city has a history also, right? So it's part of the systemic aspect. Um, and so what do you see the role of making such a film in as part of the struggle against police violence? I, I can just very quickly say, I think, and I think the conversations we've had since the film came out uh, confirm this, that there is a real value, um, and it's not to knock, you know, the the news item, uh, you know, about oh this and this happened, uh, but in the detailed narratives, hearing from somebody like Godfrey who went through what he went through, hearing that detailed narrative, to me as as a viewer, like that, those personal stories is what sticks with me, is what you know really, uh, you know, I think compels, um, you know, the the more substantive uh, action. So. I think that, um, you know, I would like to think anyone who watches this film uh, would have a, a hard time in saying, oh, well, these aren't problems that have, you know, happen in Canada because we're so used to that. And we think that's a huge problem in this country. It's like, oh, these are American problems, racism and police violence, uh, because we have, again, these concrete examples of somebody like, you know, Godfrey and what they've been through. So I, you know, as Rabinder said, I, I think we, we see the film as a starting point, a kicking off point for bigger conversations. And um and we couldn't do that with again without the courage of uh, of Godfrey and the others uh, in the film, you know, for for sharing their stories and being willing to put themselves, you know, in the spotlight because it's as Godfrey I'm sure can say it's not a comfortable 
uh, position to be in. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. And Godfred, you have indeed courageously brought your struggle and your story um, to the public eye. And so first of all, I want to commend you for that and ask you how you are doing. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm doing great, you know, um, just living living the life day by day, you know, just hanging out in here, not giving up in life, you know, just, you know, just staying strong. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a long fight. It's a, it's going to be a battle, but that's what warriors are here for. Yeah. And, um, we just spoke, you know, uh, Mark and Robinder spoke about their work to tell stories, but I want to learn, I want to know what has been the process and what has this meant for you to tell your story through a movie like this? How has this process of participating in this movie, um, what has it meant for you? It means it means a lot. It really means a lot. You know, I get to share my story um, to the world, you know, bring some awareness um, on this police brutality issue. And um, I'm just grateful to be a part of it, you know, I just, you know, just if I was to shut up and not do anything about it, I'll feel guilty for the rest of my life, right? So I had to come out there and just say something about it. That's, you know, that's going to bring some awareness into on, on this, on this police brutality issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so we have a first clip. That, and Godfrey, I will come back to you after. We have a first clip that we wanted to show of the movie, and then we can continue the exchange right after. And um, Godfrey, I think this excerpt and other parts of the movie really show um, the multiple injustices that were done to you throughout this process, right? Because though the start of it is the police violence that you're subjected to, the fact that you were brought to court, the fact that you know the rest of the case is never heard, are really different levels and different forms of injustices. And so, I really wanted to hear you. And you, you in the movie, you speak about seeking justice, still demanding justice. And so, in the face of these injustices, what would justice look like for you? What does justice mean in the face of a legal system um, that hasn't provided justice? To me, it would be like, you know, punishing the officers, you know, charge them for the crime that they did. You know, mm -hmm. if if I was to hit the officer, I would be charged. I didn't even touch him and I was charged. So mm -hmm. imagine what it would have done to me if I touched him, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like when the tables are turned, it favors them. But when the tables are turned, it doesn't favor me. You know, it's like, it's just not fair, you know? Mm -hmm. And it has to stop. Like they need to start holding officers who break the law and, you know, commit crimes, you got to hold them accountable. You know, that's the only way that, you know, they're going to learn from their mistakes, right? And yeah, justice to me too, will be like, give them some jail time, you know? You can't just, you can't just be a police officer, commit crimes, quit the job or resign, and then just get away with it, you know? And if that was the case, then the whole system wouldn't make sense, right? And yeah, to me, justice would be like punishing these officers, not just like a slap on the wrist, but like, you know, put them away in jail for a long, t a long time. Mm -hmm. And so there's the question of accountability and the question of justice. And so Mark and, and Robin, I'm curious as to doing this movie and digging through these stories and understanding the relationships between them, has this changed your own understanding of justice and injustice? I think for me, you know, uh, the clip you chose is actually just one that really, it, it, it still just, it drives me insane because yeah. this idea that this happened to Gottfried and then they sat down and the prosecutors, multiple crown prosecutors looked at this and said, let's charge the guy who got beat up. Let's take it all the way to trial. He's got a lawyer now, a lawyer is saying, let's, you know, we have the video, it's clear Gottfried didn't do anything. Let's get, you know, let's dismiss these charges. And they take it all the way to trial. This cost Gottfried tens of thousands of dollars. It stressed him out for who knows how much extra time, you know. He could have ended up with a criminal record. He could have been incarcerated. 
And for what? I mean, you have to ask, like, if these are the people who are enforcing justice in our society, they're totally unelected, they're, they're not accountable to us at all. And this is how the system is run in Canada. And so it really, you know, the process of making this film, it really woke me up to just how little accountability there is when it comes to our officers of justice, the crown prosecutors, the people who are actually uh, running the system. We hear a lot about DAs in the US, but meanwhile, in Canada, prosecutors are appointed. They frequently go on to be judges. And if they're doing things like this in Godford's case, you really have to wonder, you really have to wonder what the hell is going on here? And, and, and how, do we, how do we crack open things so that there's some more transparency? Because it's just, it, it, it's still, again, as you can tell, I'm just totally flustered by that notion that they would have taken it to trial or that even that he would have been charged in the first place. And, and this is, um, I just want to say, it wasn't just like some rookie or like some junior prosecutors, you know, these guys are like experienced, you know, prosecutors, you know, that should know what they're doing, right? So, so for them to look about my, my um, incident and the whole videos and evidence and everything, and proceed to t take me to trial and all that stuff is just brutal, you know? I don't know if because I'm black or what, but that's, that's how I look at it right now. And, and just to clarify, the prosecutor who prosecuted Godford actually took the trial. He's promoted now, still works for Alberta Justice and is in an even higher role of authority. No accountability whatsoever. Okay. And, well, and, I'll, well, and I'll add the, and the, the boss of that prosecutor is now a judge. So there is this direct through line I'll just add very quickly. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the folks here were interested in, uh, you know, in uh, dismantling the carceral state. And, and and that's like an inherent, you know, to me, a, a twin um, piece in when we're discussing policing. I will say and to echo or to borrow the words of Patrick Heffin and Anthony's father at the end of the film, he says injustice is a terrible thing. Uh, this is, I think, when you have uh, unaddressed uh, crime, specifically when we're dealing with police officers, the very people in the system in which we currently exist who are entrusted with protecting people. I mean, this is incredibly toxic and, and the results are far reaching. And I think that um, the impunity enjoyed by police officers and the clear double standards that we see articulated in the film uh, are very, very damaging. So while I am not a rah-rah champion for the prison industrial complex writ large, I do think that if police officers were actually uh, prosecuted in a meaningful sense and paid the price, so to speak, again, in the system in which we, we, we currently exist for their crimes, their fellow officers would be far, far, far less likely to behave in that kind of way. There is clearly, uh, to me, a, a, a positive uh, reinforcement cycle where somebody can behave like they did to Gottfried, uh, behave like we just saw in Calgary with the incident the other weekend, and and again, the, the consequences uh, are just uh, are are virtually nothing across the board. Uh, very quickly, and I saw there's somebody in Edmonton. I'm sure they're aware that there was another shooting in Edmonton where uh, police officers were pursuing a robbery suspect, and there was an innocent person in their home who was shot and killed by the police in Calgary. There was no less than six bullets from the police entered into this apartment building and actually killed somebody. And again, this is in direct uh, contravenance of the most basic policy, which says very clearly in the Edmonton, and I'm sure this is across the board in most police departments, if not all, says some, like the, the phrasing is actually very casual. It says it's much better to let a criminal get away than it is to harm an innocent bystander. And I look at this case in Edmonton and I really wonder, I mean, if we can't get some sort of change after something like that, I mean, my God. And actually, I think this is a perfect leeway. I'd like to um, invite Marlene Lopez to the conversation because you just touched upon the question of the prison industrial system, right? And I think the movie details very well the ways in which the police, the police that investigates the police and the prosecution work together as a system that actually prevents uh, police offenders from being held accountable. And so um, this, this, the question then becomes, is accountability even possible because of the way the system was built? And so um, Marianne Lopez works with um, Defund the Police in Montreal. And I would like to hear, um, first of all, Marianne, that you introduce us to what Defund the Police does here, but also uh, speak to this question of, can the system hold police offenders accountable? 
So the coalition, th first of all, thanks for the invitation. The coalition to defund SPVM or the police um, here in Montreal um, is a coalition of around over 75 organizations and collectives that are working, to, you know, have been working really hard to raise awareness around uh, prison abolition um, and defunding the police being a strategy within, you know, the prison abolition framework. And so we've been working around in our different communities, communities that are the ones that bear the brunt of policing, the, you know, the violence of policing and um, raising awareness on how by defunding um, from policing and reinvesting in community, we can really um, work towards ensuring public safety. And one of our objectives is to push, you know, our communities and, um, you know, the city as a whole to reimagine public safety because we've been taught that, you know, police are there to protect us and that they're the guarantors of, you know, public safety. But um, reality paints a very different picture. Absolutely. And one thing also uh, that we have we had the chance to exchange about is that um, we see how uh, wellness checks actually often turn into acts of violence from police officers against the very people that they are supposed to be checking in. Um, can you speak a bit more about the inherent dangers in actually having police officers conduct these wellness checks and why they also have been key aspect of campaigns of defund the police? So yeah, so the document, something I really appreciated from the from the film was um, how it was raised, how wellness checks, what they call <laughs> wellness checks, uh, often end up in um, violent and uh, lethal inter interventions. And so organizers have been demanding for years that the police not be the first responders in cases of mental health crisis. And they continue to, you know, be sent in these cases. And we just saw recently, and you've all mentioned in Calgary, Ladger Tool was recently killed in a concept in the in the context of a police intervention following an episode of mental distress, mental health distress. And so the police officers claim that resp that the responding officers followed protocol, which only validates what you know organizers claims that police shouldn't and are not equipped to be first responders in situations of mental distress. So instead of continuing to invest in policing, um, you know, we could invest money in developing um, like task force that are equipped to respond in cases of mental health distress. And this has been done elsewhere and other cities. So why can't we imagine another strategy if the one that we're you know using is not working and it's um resulting in in death so i think that's uh, an important issue that was raised and i think you 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 asked a, a question you had you had asked two questions and i forgot to ask the second question to answer the second question but i thought it was um really important that the documentary also raised the issue of uh, the police discretionary powers and their ability to suspend the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the so-called name of public safety. And um, to give this much power to an institution that has historically caused so much harm and has been mandated to uphold white supremacy um, is, you know, that should push us to try to reimagine what we call pub public safety. And that compounded with the lack of accountability um, mechanisms right now. We have cops investigating po cops, something else that was mentioned during the film. Um, it, these are things that need to be addressed. And it can, I don't see how we can continue working with the same strategies, with the same frameworks, and repeating the same mistakes year after year, decade after decade. This is not something new. This is something that's been going on historically. And so we have to, instead of asking ourselves, um, how can 
we reform policing. We have, because if, if you study the history of policing, they're actually doing what they were mandated to do. So what would reform, what, what, what would reform bring us in terms of they're doing, they act upon their mandates. They, you know, they, that's why they can't be held accountable because they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. And so that's why we need to imagine, um, to find other ways to imagine and to ensure public safety. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, which is the question that I was asking. Is accountability, is accountability even possible within that system, right? And I think that brings uh, bigger questions. And so I think we're going to go to a second clip. And after the clip, bring everyone back together to wrap up the conversation. Um, so Alan, you can show the second clip. Thank you. And so I think this uh, clip is is fitting to just kind of bring back some of the themes that we have discussed. But um, I'd like to really, um, for from all your different perspectives, so that we speak to one thing that to me clearly also emerges from the movie, um, is how police force and inclined also with you know prosecutors in the legal system really build discourses that construct the victims of their violence as threats. Um, this is not only stigmatizing the victims, but it also is used to justify the violence that is imposed on them. Um, Godfred, you speak in the movie of how the police called you the bad guy as you were the one being assaulted. Um, Mark and Robinder, this is a thread that you kind of pick up on the movie multiple times um, in different stories. And um, Marlene, we've had discussions on, you know, how this plays into kind of respectability politics. So who is perceived as a threat so that, you know, incarceration, criminalizing can be justified. And so I was wondering from all your perspectives, if you can speak a little bit about that, how you see these forms of stigmatizations happening and how they are also, in a sense, another form of violence from the system. I mean, Godfrey being called the bad guy, if that's not another act of violence, then I don't know, you know, what it is. So. How do we understand violence in different ways as well? I, I'll jump in quickly. I think uh, one thing that many victims of police violence have in common is this, they're dehumanized by the police. And it, it happens in a way very, immediately when they arrive on the scene, whether it's someone who's facing a mental health crisis, whether it's someone who's been using drugs or is you know, labeled as a, as a drug user, um, whether it's a person of color or black or indigenous person. And, and I think especially in Canada, I mean, if you look at any of the numbers around how indigenous people and black people in particular are treated by the police, it's, it's very clear that this is a systemic problem. And so, but, but it does happen to other communities as well. And I think the, the common thread is this dehumanization, this mentality that is baked into the system of policing that is we are the good guys the police are the good guys and everyone we encounter is probably a bad guy and it's not about a community that we're all part of but rather there's an us versus them mentality that you just see play out again and again and it allows people to make very sort of violent actions permissible in their own minds but then when you have the crown prosecutors the accountability bodies taking the same stances, it's very disturbing. And I think one thing that ACER does, you know, whenever there's someone that they're trying to paint uh, the actions of the police as justifiable, they release, you know, if someone is found with like a broken knife or what, they take photos of it and they put it on their Twitter, you know? Uh, and, and it's just, to me, just another example of how you're basically putting this out there in the public's mind that, oh, this must be a person who was trying to harm the police. Even if the person was screaming and this actually happened, help me, help me, and was killed by the police, you still put the pictures of the knives up on your Twitter feed so that people will immediately associate this person as some sort of offender or criminal, whatever. And, and I think that, you know, you see this calling God for the bad guy is another example where you just see them using language and, and tactics that are essentially othering and, and also creating a, um, a villain out of, out of anyone that they encounter. It's a really big problem. Uh, 
I can carry on. Um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with uh, everything that Marlian said more. I mean, uh, people point out in, in, in the States, you know, our police departments, you know, the, that they were essentially grew out of the slave patrols in Canada. Our police departments grew out of primarily, you know, especially in Western Canada, the RCMP. I mean, these are institutions that uh, to this day clearly behave like uh, occupying forces. Uh, the extent to which uh, class is, is, is a huge factor. In the case of Anthony Heffernan, this was a uh, this was a cheap uh, hotel in a sort of in a not fancy part of the city. You know, we rented that same hotel room for what you saw in the film for the you know it was fifty something dollars a night. I refuse to believe that if he had been staying in the Palliser Fairmont Hotel downtown Calgary for five hundred dollars a night, the police would have kicked in the door and shot him, regardless of what he had in his hands. Uh, I, I mean, they would have just run his uh, his credit card again. And why they didn't do it in that case is a whole other disturbing question. So yeah, I mean the the layers of of violence, I mean, are multifarious and uh, just profoundly disturbing. And I couldn't agree more that what we need is a a dramatic, uh, not a reforming of this, that, and the other, but a dramatic, uh, you know, uh, rejection of and reimagining of the whole system. I mean, how we there's we can have strategy discussions all day long about how to get there, and those are the, the discussions. I would like to think that a film like ours, um, you know, would help to help to encourage. Oh, 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 oh go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, like, um, looking at the whole situation with the with the larger larger case. Um, and the whole videos and everything is just so traumatizing for me. You know, just, this is broad daylight, right? Like who in their right mind will have a knife and a stick sitting outside in the cold somewhere, like looking like he's meditating or whatever, and try and charge at the cops. Like who in their right mind would do that kind of stuff, right? So for them to just kill him like broad daylight when there's like people around, everybody's screaming like, don't kill him, don't shoot and all that. And they still shot and kill him. So looking at that broad daylight, and in my situation, it was just me and this guy. There was nobody around at like three or four in the morning, you know? And this guy could have easily like killed me, right? And the police force would just cook up a story and come tell the public, hey, Godfrey was high on drugs or like he had a knife or he did something. Like I'll be dead. I wouldn't be dead. I, I wouldn't be dead to, to be able to tell my, my side of the story, right? So like looking at the whole situation is just, it's terrible. Like, I think the CPS needs to do a better job of, you know, dealing with the public and dealing with people with mental health issues. You know, like this guy was probably like, he was a child soldier. He was probably having like episodes, you know, like, like if you saw his movement, the way he was moving, like this guy is moving, like he's in the metrics or something, you know, like, and it's just, the whole video is just disturbing. It's just, like it's CPS, I think it is just getting worse and worse and worse every year, you know? Like I was thinking maybe this documentary might slow them down, bring some changes in the police force or whatnot, but it seems like it's getting worse. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. And, and I'll just add to that, what I find, one of, one of many things I find so crazy is the police chief, the best he could say as an excuse essentially for what happened is, Oh, well, the call that we got, we were, the police were not responding to a mental health call. It was like, it was a call of assault. Hold on a sec. You're telling me, like, if I call and say whatever particular thing that the police arriving again in force, multiple units don't have the capacity to arrive on the ground and make an assessment about what the situation is. Like, that's what's determining the behavior. I mean, my, like, what a, what a just a brutal uh, lack of any sort of I mean, to me, what a demonstration of their own uselessness and inutility other than that excuse. Well, we got a call for an assault. What does that have to do with anything? Get out of here. Terrible. But the, and I, the, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I saw a video where the, the guy was holding a knife in in one hand and blah, blah, blah. And the police shot him with a rubber bullets. And that's when he dropped the knife. So I'm thinking to myself, you shot the guy and then he dropped the most dangerous weapon that he had on him. He dropped it and, and he had just a stick, just a stick that he had. 
So for you to shoot him and kill him, like, oh my goodness, it's just, yeah. And and, and I'll sorry, and I don't want to take up so much time, but uh, Anissa pointed out somebody said that he was holding a machete. Even if he were, everybody look up a clip on YouTube that says UK police disarm man with machete. Okay, there's a there's an instance of a lar- of a guy with a machete in the street. Did he end up killed? No. Using essentially like full body shields, they kind of like corralled him or whatever and waited to calm down. I mean, the the excuses that are given in this country, the standards for policing. Oh well, you know, Anthony Heffern, maybe he had a little needle in his hand, which is dubious. Uh, or uh, Lajo had a knife. I mean, the notion that that requires somebody to be killed, I think, is we 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 absolutely need to re- re- reject the argument that that is the only way to deal with the situation because it's absolutely not the case. Just to add, um, it's important to also point out that this um, speaks to the historical yeah. weaponization of black bodies. You know, we see it when police kill black children and um, the way that, you know, the media portrays these killings, we see them in every violent interaction that police have um, that involves uh, uh, black folks. It's the weaponization and the dehumanization of you know, our bodies. And it's something that is also, that, you know, is compounded. If you, when you investigate a lot of uh, the police killings involve also um, black folks with disabilities, you know, with, especially with uh, neural developmental disabilities, whether it be, you know, black, if you look in the state, black autistic men that have died in the hands of of the police. So it's also important to point out how certain communities are dehumanized and, you know, certain bodies are are weaponized and how it plays out in justifying um, the way that the police intervenes uh, absolutely. And as, as we continue, I also just want to invite if uh, anyone in the public has questions, you can either uh, share them with our team on Facebook or in the chat. Um, but something that strikes me about uh, Mark, you know, when you were talking about that, is that really, you know, the, the kind of the way to go? I think it echoes back to what Marlene was saying earlier is that isn't that the actual answer of the police? You know what I mean? So we keep on being surprised, like it's a shocking that they wouldn't think of any other way of intervening, but isn't it actually how their system is built, you know? And so Marianne, you spoke about this a bit earlier um, of where kind of understanding where the, the police emerges from also allows us to understand the violence that is inherent in their practice. And so I don't know if you want to maybe expand on this so yeah, as, as a as a prison abolitionist, I I don't believe that we can reform the police. You know, there's certain things that we could do to diminish the harm, but if you really want to to um, to address this systemic nature of you know this this systemic violence that involves policing, I think that you know we need to go beyond looking at reforms and really acknowledge that the police is is actually doing what it's meant to be doing and they always say it when you know when someone tries to hold them accountable in, in the context of a violent um in the context of a you know lethal force in, in an intervention they always say well they followed protocol and yeah they did follow protocol because you're you're giving you know this institution, the tools and the power, the discretionary power, and the and the weapons and the and the guns, to to decide, you know, who deserves, who deserves to to um, come out of a situation alive, because like you said before, there's m- many situations, and I've seen it here, like two years ago, I believe there was a white man with a sword, like a, and walking down. Quebec, and he was seized. Like if it was a black man walking down Quebec City with a huge sword, you, you can believe that the outcome would have been totally different. And so, so yeah. Add on to 
Um, I just want to add on to what you just said, Lopez. Um, just like a few last year, sometime around summertime, um, just before win winter started, um, there, was, there was a white guy running around here at the train station with a machete, like actually like hurting people with it. And I didn't hear about him getting shot or none of that stuff. So what's going on here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so some um, some comments in the chats are being um, also that, you know, this is a, a very important also contrast to, for instance, how the Freedom Convoy uh, was handled right now in, in Ottawa, right? If it had been racialized and black bodies in, as a majority in that convoy, um, the state answer might have been very different. Um, also, one person is asking, is saying, you know, yes, we must talk about abolition as a solution, not just as a slogan, um, but what could abolition be and what could abolition actually look like? And so I think it's an interesting question, maybe also with the idea of what next, what now, um, which all of you can speak to and maybe Marlian, you can expand a little bit. What could abolition actually look like? So for me, abolition starts now. We need to start working to have th that world that we want tomorrow. And it's, 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 there's different steps. There's different approaches. Um, for me, um, it's about reinvesting in community because, and, and reinvesting in order to address the root causes of violence. Um, the we've seen during the pandemic how um at least in quebec uh the budget for the police has continued to increase and to increase and we know that you know and the the police is not efficient in ensuring public safety studies across the world have proved that policing is a reactionary approach that doesn't really address the root causes of insecurity and so why do we keep invest? We have to ask ourselves, why do we keep investing in these um, strategies that don't produce the outcomes that are supposed to be, you know, if we're talking about pu public safety. And so for me, abolition is investing day to day in transforming, um, you know, investing day to day and working to have that world that we we desire to have in the future and i think we all can play a role in achieving that um if i can jump in very quickly i think um i totally agree with everything Marianne's saying and i think one of the l jones put out a really good report uh if, if you know something that you can read up on it's out of, out of halifax uh about defunding and one of the concepts that i think is really useful because you know obviously we're not going to go straight to abolition tomorrow one of the things that i think is really important is detasking so insisting and whether it's at your local police commission meeting or anywhere else that insisting that when there is a call for assistance for mental health that two armed officers are not the response there are models for this and hamilton is a city that they're they're rolling this out more and more we need to have far far more of it and when you look at the number of calls that are associated with some sort of uh, addiction issue uh, or someone having a mental health crisis or even someone who, who's in need of a social worker and not an officer we realize that many of the things that we want could be started by detasking and then moving forward once you have detasked many of the things that the police are currently doing and we can start talking about you know what what does a different institution altogether look like because i agree that it's it seems irreparably broken absolutely um and so we have a minute left maybe uh before the concluding thoughts i'll invite mark and godfred um if you have a quick thought on what next as we wrap up i think i think we need more transparency and um, accountability um, in, the, in the police force. Yeah, I just think uh, the more people that are involved in these issues that are participating in whatever fashion uh, they can, the awareness, I just think it's, uh, you know, I, I hope that our film is one that can change uh, the minds even of uh, those that are more on the, on the defensive side. There's just a lot of facts there that are hard to disregard. 
Uh, so hopefully that can contribute. Also just mentioned that there's a Justice for Godfrey GoFundMe campaign. Godfrey has been to hell and back and uh, always like to uh, direct anyone that can chip into um, uh, to that particular cause of, of Godfrey here would, uh, would be really appreciated on our behalf. Thank you. And Is there a way we can share that? That's So there's the GoFundMe. I think our team is trying to see if they can. I think the links will be put on the Facebook page of Cinema Politica. I think that will be the easiest. Um, and so I really want to thank everyone for coming, for participating. And um, as concluding thoughts, I really want to uh, reflect on this idea of, of you documenting this resistance. Um, the resistance that, you know, Godfrey and other survivors of police violence and their families are, are doing. And I think documenting resistance to police violence and other forms of state violence is also part of the work needed to confront these structures and systems of violence. Documenting resistance entails the work to preserve and pass on the stories of who, how, where, and when people struggled against this violence. And this ultimately, I understand as the work of building archives of resistance. And these archives are needed to create breaks and fissures in the historical narratives that allow states or provinces for that matter to deny the systemic forms of violence that they are built upon and reproduce. Um, building these archives, whether in the forms of movies, of stories, of physical archives, the men that we look around us, that we look before us to know who has done the visible as well as the less visible and sometimes the downright invisible work to call out the police, to care for those affected by police violence, to build networks around them or their families. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that building any archive of resistance is also building an archive of trauma, like I think this movie demonstrates and is aptly titled. Therefore, these archives and the records and the stories they hold demand sensitivity, humility, and compassion. And they also demand an unequivocal support from all of us and a collective response. And so this is what I want to end this um, exchange on. Thank you very much for having been with us. Godfred, thanks again for sharing your story, um, for continuing the struggle. Mark Robinder, thanks for being archivist and documentarist of this story. Marlian, thank you for continuing your work here and all the team at Cinema Politica for organizing this exchange. And so let us continue building these archives of resistance until we need them no more. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.